All right, so we are now recording. And um, go ahead and please sign in at uh, this tiny URL. That just lets us know who all made it here, um, kind of the demographics, like are you on projects, are you not on projects, that kind of thing. Let's us know how we can plan better in the future. Um, the recording of this event will be posted on our website, itprojects.org. Um, there's also a lot of other really cool things on the website, um, so if you want to go check it out, highly recommend. Uh, the recording will be up in probably a few days and we'll have timestamps for um, when all the presentations are. Um, so IG Projects is a sub-team of IG, which is the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, and our... oh. I forgot I had this slide here. So we're getting started. Please mute your microphones. Um, this is to avoid copious background noise. And uh, I believe you should have been muted on entry, but if you unmute yourself, just remember to unmute yourself um, at the end of your presentation. Uh, we will be hearing the, a presentation from all of our teams today. And that's very exciting. I'm very excited. If you have a question for the team while they're presenting, we're going to have questions at the very end for about five minutes. Um, go ahead and put it in the chat or just wait to ask it verbally. Um, and so we have a, our schedule here, uh, all times approximate. Um, we'll start with some opening remarks and then we'll have all six teams present. And then we'll end with some awards, including statements and then a poster session um, for an hour at the end. And we'll have more details about that later. Okay. Um, so IT Projects is a sub-team of IT, and our goal is to promote engineering um, excellence and just uh, help people get hands-on experience with um, the things that they're learning in the classroom. Um, because a lot of what we're learning is pretty theoretical, but it's good to get um, some real experience with what you're doing and also to connect with industry, connect with other students, professionals, and things like that. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really great opportunity and uh, it's it's um, a very interesting, fun way to make a difference in the world. Our mission is to, sell, is to create technically minded individuals and ethical contributors to society. Um, so our goal is that IT projects really helps people grow as engineers, as people. And uh, this showcase is supposed to help us see um, how our mission has come about throughout the year. Um, so quickly, I just wanted to introduce our leadership team. Uh, Janessa, Aaron, and Aku uh, were the director, manager, and research coordinator for this last year. They will all be graduating this year, which is very exciting. And I just want to give them a big thank you for all of the help that they've, all the things that they've done this year. They worked really hard and I really appreciate what they've done. Um, me, Nick, and Jared will be taking over as the director, manager, and research coordinator for this year. Um, we're very excited to work with you all. And uh, please let us know if there's anything we can do for you. We're always there to help. And then Diana, Herde, Harleen, and Joy will be joining us as the assistant director, uh, manager, and research coordinator. We're very excited to have them on the team and we're hoping for a really great year with you all next year. All right, so to get started, we have our six project teams. Uh, we decided to not go in alphabetical order this year. So we're gonna start with portable wind power and end with photonic fabrics. Um, so yeah, uh, if we could get started with uh, Portable One Power, we would love to see your presentation. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. <laughs> All right, so my name is Anthony. I'm one of the co-PMs for the Portable Wind Power team. And so our team was really founded um, with the goal in mind, we wanted to uh, harness one of San Diego's natural resources. And we found that we have really strong winds coming out of like the glider port area and then also through the kids near campus. We realized that that wind power is, is really going unharnessed. Um, and so we wanted to be able to find a way to turn that wind into electricity. And so wind power isn't, isn't a new thing. The first wind turbine um, built to capture electricity in 1887. So this technology has been around uh, for a long time. The technology is also pretty based. Um, right now, a little bit more than 5% of electricity in the U.S. is generated um, through wind power. Unfortunately, the wind generated through these uh, large turbines, as you see here. So um, as a student-run team, we really don't have the resources, the building capabilities, or like the permitting um, 
and permissions to build a large wind turbine. So we wanted to build something a little bit smaller, a little bit more portable. Um, we came up with the portable wind turbine team. So we want to build a, a portable wind turbine that we can uh, break down, reassemble in different parts of campus and use to charge small electronic devices. So um, because we had a rather large team, we decided to break up our team into two sub teams. One of the sub teams worked on a horizontal wind turbine assembly, which rotates on a horizontal axis. And then the other sub team worked on a more novel design, which is our vertical wind turbine. And so we did this for two reasons. First, we wanted all our team members to be able to have a chance to um, contribute really to the design and have a hands-on um, contribution to the project. And we thought by splitting into two sub-projects, this would help us accomplish that goal. Also, we really wanted to test the classic horizontal wind turbine versus the vertical wind turbine to see which is more efficient in producing electricity. Um, and so the goal is to build both prototypes, compare the prototypes and see which is more efficient and then move on and further develop the more efficient prototype. And so um, in order to conserve resources, um, both materials and economic funding resources, we knew that the turbines had to have some shared components. And so the main shared component that we worked on is our universal base. So the universal base is gonna consist of a, a tripod and then an acrylic housing, which will store our generator and our, um, all our electrical components uh, to keep them safe from the element. And so the goal is to have our universal base and be able to uh, switch out um, both blade assemblies relatively quickly with just like undo a few screws, um, take out one assembly, put in the other one so that we can uh, quickly switch it out in the field and uh, efficiently perform our testing. So our team, um, we're gonna have five members uh, returning in the fall. Um, it's going to be me, the other co-PM, Michelle, Casey, Brian, and Henry. Um, and really lucky to have a great group of seniors that are going to be graduating from the team. Um, these seniors contributed a lot of energy to the team and some really great ideas, and we're definitely going to miss them in the fall. But our graduating seniors are the current uh, co-PM, Sophie, Caroline, Janessa, Daniel, and Jacob. So the main goal of this team is to uh, build a turbine that can generate clean energy from wind power. Um, but a secondary goal for this team is to make sure that the members of our team have some tangible skills that they can take with them outside of the team. And so three of the main skills we really focus on on this team are Arduino, um, CAD, uh, specifically SOLIDWORKS, and then uh, materials fabrication, which is usually done with laser cutter. So throughout the year, uh, we had multiple meetings where we sat down as a team and we went through uh, what circuitry we needed for the wind turbine, um, how are we gonna build that and how do we program it? And so we made sure that each member had some hands-on experience with Arduino and then that they were able to see um, the programming method. Uh, both sub teams also had uh, CAD sessions throughout the year where we'd sit down and we'd, we'd talk out our design ideas and then we'd uh, work as a team to design in SOLIDWORKS so that every team member could see um, the specific functions in SOLIDWORKS and, and get some experience with that. And then toward the end of the winter quarter, um, we did a lot of uh, the beginning of the fabrication process using the laser cutter and that involved a whole lot of troubleshooting up in InVision. Um, so for the 2019-2020 school year, our progress this was cut a little bit short by the stay-at-home order, but regardless, in the winter and the fall, we still made some good progress. Uh, so the main thing that we finished in the fall is the design of our, uh, our universal base. Um, so we spent a lot of time on the whiteboard and even in SOLIDWORKS designing this universal base so that it could be compatible with both our blade assemblies. Um, a main milestone that we, that we crossed this year was receiving project funding. So in addition to the TESC funding we received, we also applied to a TGIF funding um, and we got that. So that was a really big deal for us. 
uh, because it means by the end of the year, we'll be able to purchase all the materials we need to finish both our prototypes. Uh, as I mentioned, toward the end of the winter, we started fabricating some of the uh, turbine parts. The horizontal team was able to cut out uh, the blades and then the mounting assembly for those blades. And the vertical team was able to design and cut out uh, the gearing system that they needed to uh, translate their vertical rotational motion into horizontal rotational motion to be compatible with our generator. And then lastly, the team was able to set up our, our, our Duino LCD display, which measures the voltage output of our generator and displays that voltage output in real time on the LCD. And it also uh, displays the maximum voltage output over time. And so because of the stay at home order, our goals kind of got pushed a quarter out. So the goal with the spring was to really hit the ground running and finish our prototype. Um, we had a couple of build weekends planned, but unfortunately that can't happen. So moving into the fall, assuming we're able to meet, our goal is to uh, pick up with we, where we left off with the fabrication process and finish building both prototypes and then move into the winter with both prototypes and start testing. So bring the turbine to different sites around campus and around San Diego. Uh, gather data on the electricity output and then see which turbine is more efficient. And then moving forward from there, we'll pick the most efficient turbine that we have. And then as a team, um, further develop that specific design. And so this project uh, wouldn't have been possible without the guidance and the funding from uh, TGIF, TESC, and IG projects. Um, so we'd like to thank them for, for helping us out on the project. Um, that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions for me about the project or about anything? All right, and just in case anyone wanted to see, here is our um, our universal base design, the drawing for it. So basically the generator would be housed in this acrylic housing so that it's protected from the elements. The vertical wind turbine would attach right here. And then we would rotate the, tur uh, the generator and then um, the horizontal wind turbine would attach on this side. So if there's no questions, I'm going to uh, stop my screen sharing um, so we can move on. Thank you, Anthony. That was really great. Um, uh, does anyone have any questions? I just want to make sure. Uh, I didn't see any in the, in the chat. OK. Uh, so our next team will be phosphorus wastewater treatment. Uh, and um, thank you, Ezekiel, for sharing your screen. <laughs> I'm very excited. This is my team. I'm not presenting this one, but I'm very excited to see how it is presented. All right. Hey, guys. Um, I'm e Ezekiel, and... Um, my name is Diana. We are both going to be co-presenting this for you, um, and we are on the phosphorus wastewater treatment team. Uh, this year, our project managers are Ezekiel and Michelle Nguyen, um, so I guess let's just hop right in and get started. Oh. <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay, so um, what our project aims to provide a solution to is eutrophication. If you ever have taken like AP environmental science or something of that sort, you'll probably be somewhat familiar with this. But basically eutrophication is when excess nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus are introduced into an aquatic environment and these nutrients allow for the exponential growth of plants such as algae and as the algae grows on top of the water um, it'll block the sunlight to anything below it which will ultimately kill plants and animals that rely on sunlight and 
Also, as the algae dies, it'll deplete the oxygen within the environment as bacteria um, breaks down the organism. So basically, it's really bad for the environment and we're trying to find a solution for it. As you can see in the picture, the left side is like a really healthy place that you like can go fishing and there's lots of biodiversity in it. But on the right side, you see like factories and farms just having their wastewater pollute the, um, the aquatic ecosystem. So we're really trying to find a solution to solve this problem. And we really care about this because it's a problem within our local society. Um, eutrophic zones can be found all over the world in different coastal areas, but in Southern California, a study has found that the sites that they tested were moderate or worsening in their eutrophic conditions. Um, so we're definitely trying to make an impact on our local community. So our goal to reduce local eutrophication is by focusing on removing the phosphorus from the wastewater that pollutes um, our aquatic ecosystem. And this year we decided to try to do that by using ion exchange. Now, what is ion exchange, you ask? Thank you for asking. Um, ion exchange is basically um, composed of a resin that is a hydrocarbon matrix filled with charged molecules. So we'll say that this resin is positively charged. Um, what we do is we run a solution through it of negative charge, which is our phosphorus. And if they have a strong enough affinity for each other, they'll basically switch places and it'll be the positive particles that are leaving the solution. So the, the phosphorus would be stuck within the resin. And we chose this because um, ultimately the resin can be reused. Um, so it'll be better for efficiency and cost. And this is a, a picture that kind of depicts what happens. On the right side, you can see the positively charged um, proteins are binding to the negatively charged beads, which is probably what I switched earlier. Um, but ultimately, what we don't want comes out. Or no, sorry. What we don't want goes in to the resin, gets stuck to the resin, and what we do want comes out. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, so basically over this past school year, um, we really just started this experiment like uh, on ion exchange. So the first quarter, we, um, we were just uh, basically trying to research what is the best method. And then we figured out ion exchange would work really well. So then winter quarter, we were just uh, experiment or, or just trying to figure out like how to do that, um, especially with phosphorus and what the best way to do it is. And then so really just in this last quarter, we started our actual like experiment and our actual testing. So the first uh, basically experiment we did or trial was simply to see if the beads worked. Um, we've never worked with them. So, um, and also just to get a baseline um, to see what we should expect. Um, and then obviously we can optimize from there and then we can compare those uh, new results to our old results. Um, so yeah, as you can see, we use beads uh, to, and we put them in the phosphorus solution and then we basically, they absorbed it and then we later precipitated it out to, um, to basically just prove that it worked and it did. So. That was good. And then the next trial we did was um, we actually try to optimize it a little by using iron oxide. We had done research that said that if you bind iron oxide to the beads, it would actually basically improve the yield. And as of now, we haven't really found that to be true. Um, so we, there's like some possible errors related to it. We'll have to experiment a little more. Um, and that's what we're doing right now. We're doing a little more research on it. But as of now, we found that's not true. And in our last trial, which is probably just as important, oops. Um, our last trial, which is probably uh, just as important is our residence time trial. And um, that's really important because as of now, you might have noticed that we're just doing batch tests. And this is meant to run in the column. Uh, we just haven't yet just because it's easy to run batch. And also we're looking for a good column. But also with the residence time uh, trials, we found that the whole like absorption process happens in less than one minute, which is good. Because obviously if it took any longer, um, it, the whole, basically the whole process wouldn't occur within the length of the tube.
So as of now, those are all the trials we've done, but our plans for next year is to continue doing more trials, uh, learning more about our system, creating a flow system with a column. Um, and then also our goal in terms of like, how, like what phosphorus is going to recycle, uh, we're going to reach out to biology labs and try to get their phosphorus uh, waste because they use a lot of phosphorus buffers. Um, so that's going to be like our first step in like the recycling process and just to test our system. Um, and yeah, so we're just going to try to grow a lot next year. And then thank you guys. Thank you to all, all our sponsors. And does anyone have any questions? And I can't see the chat right now. Um, but I'm going to assume that's no. And if you have any questions, just uh, drop a message in the chat or come see our poster afterwards. Thank you guys. That was really great. Um, that was a really good looking presentation, by the way. <laughs> I, I wonder who uh, helped make that. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, again, like Ezekiel said, if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop them in chat whenever or go to a poster session. Um, poster session is a really great place to get all your questions answered. All right, let's hear from our next team. It is active water treatment. Um, okay, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Breesh Keenan, and I'm here to introduce the Active Water Treatment Project team. So our team basically aims to alleviate the substandard health and living conditions in the Navajo Nation by cleaning their water supply of its heavy metal and nuclear ion contaminants. And then next slide. So this is our team right now. Um, Aaron and Jane are the leading project managers and myself along with Haley Morris are gonna be next year's project managers. Hi, I'm Isabella. So to give you some background, uranium was discovered in the Navajo territory in the 1940s. And that's when the US mining companies began extracting uranium from the Navajo nation for over four decades to keep up with the demand for nuclear energy. While the mining has stopped since, its legacy lives on in the 225 abandoned mines. You can see the mines on this map. Um, they're into six clusters. And then from this map, you can also see how Arizona is a state with the most contaminated mines. The improper closure of these mines has allowed uranium to seep into the surrounding landscape, polluting not just the soil and air, but most alarmingly, the water. The primary pollutant found in these runoffs is uranium ions, but traces of thorium, radium, polonium, and even arsenic were prevalent in the water tests conducted by the EPA. Um, and according to the EPA, the maximum contamination level of uranium allowed in water is 30 ppb, but some of these sites have up to 700 ppb of uranium. And this is very dangerous because the uranyl ion is a known mutagen and carcinogen. Hi, my name is Mariana. And so the problem with this is that drinking or consuming through crop has been linked to increased rates of cancer, organ failure, and hereditary birth defects in the Navajo population due to the fact that the radio active uranium contaminated the water that grows their crops. On top of that, the average American uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water per day, while the entire Navajo Nation family only gets access to seven gallons of water per day. Therefore, the active water treatment's mission in the Navajo Nation is to alleviate substandard living conditions by removing radioactivity, heavy metal contaminants from the local sources of water. Um, our team is specifically targeting a well in Tohachi Spring, which has a uranium concentration of 120 parts per billion, which is about four times the EPA limit. Uh, we chose to choose a specific well to better focus our initial design solutions. All right, so um, our approach is actually also on exchange. This is pure coincidence. 
from the previous group. Um, but just to explain it again, uh, we're doing specifically anion exchange, where there are resins, they start with a uh, negative ion already attached to them. But um, as we flow our water with uranium, uh, the, the uranium has a higher affinity for the resin, so it will kick out um, the, the negative ion that was there before. Um, and uranium in well water usually takes the form of negatively charged calcium carbonate complexes, so we'll be targeting those specifically. And as explained by the previous group, uh, this approach is good because you can reuse the resin because the beads can be regenerated and it can be used in a continuous system, making it uh, more efficient. So for our project, we want to utilize this approach of ion exchange that Yang just talked about, um, which is traditionally found in these large factory sized ion exchange columns. And uh, that's not the most efficient because it requires people to transport water to the stationary column, which can be expensive for transportation. And it's also just inconvenient. So we want to design a portable version that would ideally fit in the back of a truck. Um, and that way we could bring this treatment to several ponds in the water sources found there. All right, so um, our current design, it's pretty simple. It's about, well, if it's six feet long and about four feet wide, and the pipes are galvanized steel. And um, we can basically figure out how this works by just following the flow of the water. So it starts in the tank, it pumps through the pump, which is on the left side, goes all the way around and it goes up through that cylinder looking thing, which is our actual ion exchange column. And then it ends up back in the tank. That way we get multiple cycles with the water, make sure all the uranyl is actually removed. So the ion exchange column um, creates potable water, but we'd also like to provide um, a nice drinking water for the Navajo Nation. So in addition to the ion exchange column, um, we're going to introduce a pre and post filtration um, elements. So the pre-treatment is going to be an activated carbon filter. So this treats the water um, through processed charcoal, which creates a really high surface area. So through chemical absorption, um, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, sediment, silt, odor, um, and taste are removed through that chemical absorption. Um, so this is a highly effective and fairly low cost method to enhance the drinkability of the water. Hi, uh, this is David and I'll be talking about the post treatment of the water. So for the water to be drinkable, we also need to remove microbes. Um, although ion exchange is very effective at treating dissolved ions, it doesn't have any effect on microbes. So that's why we plan to implement UV sterilization. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so what happens is that we're going to have the UV lamps that'll sit over the water in our storage tank. And when we turn them on, uh, the microbes will be killed in a matter of minutes. Next slide, please. We chose UV because it has several advantages. Uh, first, it doesn't use a lot of energy and is relatively cheap. It's also proven to be very effective. It's already being used in homes and aquariums. It's also being used to fight the coronavirus right now. Also, since UV doesn't use any chemical disinfectants, it minimizes any byproducts added to the water. Um, and it's also very easy to maintain. You just have to replace the bulb every year or so. Yeah. All right, hi, I'm Rebecca. Uh, this is a look at what we want our next year's prototype to look like. We have the activated carbon filter uh, integrated into the system as well as the UV lamp. Uh, and we also have an additional tank added to the left there uh, so that we can treat water in batches. Uh, for our final build, uh, you know, our long-term goal, uh, we want to have valve to water control. Uh, we want to add in a second ion exchange. 
and we want uh, we want to use a specific resin uh, actually we can commercialize the Tiran, uh, but this would require pH control. Uh, so to support pH control, we would want to uh, integrate Arduino into it. And this will help us not only control the pH, but also monitor the temperature. Okay, hi, I'm Jane. And so one of the important things for us to keep in mind as we prototype our build is to see whether the pressure across the column is optimal. And if the flow is too strong, then the contact time of the water and the resins may be too little to fully treat the water. And so in order to determine the pressure, we'll be using the energy Bernoulli's equation, which you can see at the bottom of this slide and you guys may be familiar with in fluid dynamics. So to figure out the necessary variables to solve for the pressure difference, we can place flow meters to calculate the velocity in and out of the column, as well as looking at properties of the material we are using, in our case, which is galvanized steel, to determine the various head losses in the system at different junctions. And so after determining the pressure in and out of our system, we can better optimize our build to treat the water more efficiently. Hi, this is Haley. Um, so our future plans, um, I know this year's been kind of crazy. So this year for the spring, we're hoping to update our CAD model with our new design. Um, we have our spring recruitment going on and um, also buy materials for our new prototype. Um, hope on this summer in 2020, we're planning on training our new members, um, looking into our funding and doing some more research on our chemicals. Um, and next fall, we hope to uh, start looking into our res resin reaction kinetics, um, go through our funding competitions, and start Arduino actuator design. And then in winter 2021, um, actually starting to build our prototype, um, and then go through our regeneration kinetics. And we want to um, further our contacts in the Navajo Nation with our new updated design and get any feedback from them. And then a year from now, we're hoping to have our like an automation of our system and hopefully get out to the Navajo Nation and test our actual design. So thank you, um, and let us know if you have any questions. Hi, uh, it's Aku. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. So I want to know a bit more about the re the regeneration. Tell me more about the resin, the, re the kinetics of the resin regeneration. Do you want to speak on that? <laughs> Um, I guess I can. I think we're right now we're mainly focusing on getting the the actual filtering part working so we can remove uranium from water and the, resent, the regeneration we just kind of know it's possible but we haven't really explored how exactly we're going to do it yet. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. Um, just to jump in really quickly, it's usually done with a strong acid. And just because of Le Chatelier's principle, you will end up stripping the uranium from the resin beads and replacing it with um, whatever whatever's the conjugate base of your strong acid. So if it is chlor if you're using hydrochloric acid, you end up replacing the uranium on the beads with the chlor chloride ion. But it still means you'll have to deal with the uranium somehow. Thank you. Is there a plan for what to do with the uranium after it's been removed, or are you still working on that? Um, we've looked into it. Um, we found some uh, resources that you can uh, take the uranium to this specific place, and they will um, dispose of it for you. Um, we found that as a cheaper option than trying to go through the process ourselves of disposing of the uranium, um, but we haven't looked into it to, like into too much detail, but we know that there are resources to dispose of the uranium. That's good. I'd imagine that disposing of it is pretty complicated, so <laughs> probably good if we could have someone else do that. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or anything? I 
think we're good. Um, if anybody has any questions, just feel free to post it on chat or come chat with us in the little presentations later. Post the presentation. All right. Thank you, AWT. That was a great presentation. Um, our next team will be Fuel Cell. Are we ready to present? Yep. Sweet. All right. Oh. Well, hopefully everybody can see my screen. All right. So, hi, my name is Brian. Uh, I am the current co-PM along with Susie, and I'll be presenting today. Uh, our Feel Your Soul project, which, uh, you know, a bit of background aims to combine uh, hydrogen storage and support to promote the idea of green infrastructure on campus. Uh, specifically, we'll have the implemented as sort of like a seating area where, you know, students can take a load off, down, charge their phones, charge their laptops uh, during the day and during the night. So a bit of how a hydrogen fuel cell works. Um, in the simplest terms, we take hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, and by flowing them across a catalyst, uh, we form water. So when this process occurs, we generate electrons, uh, and by having them connected together, we can produce a current. So now, in terms of our design, uh, we have used a set of plates uh, that when we connect in series together uh, and flow you know, our gases across allows us to produce our uh, electricity. Uh, in order to increase the amount of uh, voltages as well as the amount of current we produce, uh, it's simply as easy as stacking more plates on top of each other in series. So our initial designs uh, came from 3D printed plastic pieces that we then painted over with conductive paint and electroplated. Uh, we had initial plans for developing it as a reversible fuel cell, that is to say, uh, not only can we produce hydrogen gas, or sorry, not only can we take hydrogen gas and produce electricity, but when we supply a source of water and another current through it, we can also produce hydrogen gas. But we've since shifted focus away from this because uh, having a reversible design only increases the degradation of our fuel cells. And it didn't sort of make it easy for us to produce pure hydrogen gas uh, as the gases come together as a mix. So now, that we've decided to shift away from this idea, we decided to develop a dedicated electrolytic cell. And so uh, pictured here is the cell we designed ourselves uh, based on the design from Kenny Park. So what it, what it does is that uh, it takes a voltage at the anode and cathode, and this uh, voltage drop across produces hydrogen and oxygen gas, uh, hydrogen being produced at the cathode and or at the anode, and oxygen produced at the cathode. Uh, this is because oxygen is negatively charged and hydrogen being positively charged. Uh, and because there is a napkin membrane in between the two, uh, both gases are kept separate, making it easy to isolate. So now that we produce hydrogen gas, how do we store it? So we've adopted the idea of using a metal hydrogen, in this case, lanthium pentanol. And the reason for doing so is because uh, we don't want to be using high pressure. Uh, if you were to store the hydrogen gas as is, we would have to use a lot of excess energy to not only power a pump that would push these gases into a canister, but this also poses a safety concern in the case of a catastrophic failure because it could blow up. And that's not a great thing. So by moving over to a you know, metal hydride, we avoid these issues and we also make it much smaller. So we can contain it in a smaller area. So as far as our design goes, uh, we need to sort of check for appropriate materials to use for the tank itself. We've sort of decided on using uh, used CO2 cartridges. Uh, and these are perfect because they are designed to handle high pressures. Um, they come in relatively small sizes that are small enough for our purposes. And their walls are thick and made of steel. So we don't worry about, you know, in the off chance that something does happen, you know, it should be able to maintain uh, high pressure ratings. So here's an example of a uh, hydrogen storage system that's done sort of in industry. It's definitely a lot more complex than what we intend to do, but the basic idea is that we have our hydrogen gas flowing across a layer of our metal hydride. And as the hydrogen gas flows across, it becomes absorbed into the material. Um, when we change 
certain conditions such as temperature and pressure, uh, we can then release these uh, hydrogen gases that have been adhered to the surface of these metal hydrides. Once we have all this together, it's time for system integration. Um, we initially had the idea of uh, putting this in conjunction with a solar umbrella on campus. Um, but once we've taken a look at it, we found that it's no longer working and we put it for the idea of uh, having a bench instead with a sort of solar panel awning as a means of providing shade and energy during the day. And then excess energy is siphoned off to produce hydrogen gas that we would store. And so that in the evening time, you can still use the bench for charging your phone because we have another source of energy. Uh, so moving forward, our goals for the upcoming year is to sort of formalize hydrogen storage design and actually work to start implementing it. Um, once this is all done, we can finally move on to sort of assembling each individual individual piece together uh, and then you know putting it on campus. And then ideally, we should have this done within the next year or a year and a half. So yeah, once again, the idea here is to sort of promote the idea of green infrastructure, sort of have pieces and areas on campus that are not only, you know, practically, um, you know, functional in the sense of that, you know, you can sit on it, but also serve a greater purpose and providing energy to the students on campus. So yeah, special thanks to IC Projects and any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, of course. Um, so in terms of the size of the fuel cell and the efficiency, like one, like what's the current size of the hydrogen fuel cells you have right now? And two, if you were to scale up these hydrogen fuel cells to something larger to power something like, I don't know, a car, I'm not sure if that's within your project area. Um, how does that affect the efficiency of the hydrogen fuel cell? Yeah, of course. So currently as it stands, our hydrogen fuel cell is pretty small. Uh, our goal was to never sort of power high, like, our objects. We only wanted to power small portable electronic devices uh, simply because we wanted to keep the size small. So uh, as it is, it's currently about, I would say, uh, the area is about, cross-sectional area is about four centimeters by four centimeters, and it's about like uh, about six centimeters long. So it's actually like a small cube. Um, we can always increase the size, like I said uh, earlier. Um, if you want to increase the amount of voltage we produce, uh, we can simply stack cells in series, and each cell uh, itself is about, uh, you know, a couple of millimeters, tens of millimeters uh, in length or width, right? Whichever, you know, orientation you decide to choose. Um, if we were to sort of move over to uh, produce enough electricity from our hydrogen fuel cell to power something like, say, a car, we definitely do run into uh, efficiency issues with our design. Um, because we are stacking plates on top of each other, at some point, resistance will become something that we need to take into account. On smaller scales, it's not as a uh, big deal. The efficiency is about, like I'd say, 80-ish percent. Um, going beyond that, we would say massive, massive decreases in efficiency. Does that Thanks. answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? No? All right. Thank you, Phil. So that was great. Um, so yeah, if anyone else has any questions uh, for the team, go ahead and drop into their poster session later. Um, other than that, our next team will be Crowd Desalination. <clears throat> Hello, we are Cryo Desalination. Oh, can, you, can everybody hear me? I guess so. So before, uh, before we start, I'd like to give a special shout out for our graduating co-project managers, Kathy and Harlan, and our incoming project managers, Kyle and I. So what is cryodesalination? Cryo uh, it is a separation of water and salt upon freezing, which utilizes the natural tendency of water to push out salt upon freezing. In practice, one, util, one util, uh, utilizes energy to cool water and form ice, as ice is forming and expels most of, so, most of the salt, resulting to, uh, resulting to the so-called brine. So the original prototype uh, is, uh, was based on a patent by Dr. Norbert, uh, Norbert B. Uh, we could not mm, implement this design because one of the factors was that it was, it was provided to be expensive for our means. 
so what we intended to do was uh, finding a new system, uh, system that was conducted by the University of Tokyo, determined, pro uh, determined progressive freezing as a viable option, which was a low design and maintenance, a uh, low design and maintenance cost, which was easy to transport. Uh, next slide, please. And this was our, uh, this was the last year's current design. We currently removed the robotic arm and uh, was, and stirred it manually. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to hand it off to Arun to continue. Okay. Slide. Hi, hello. Um, so yeah, so the last picture was a past design and I'm going to talk about some of the issues with uh, the prototype and some of the improvements that we've made. Uh, so the big issue that we had before was that salt water was, um, it just wasn't able to freeze. Uh, the coolant that we had was just dry ice and on its own, that's not enough to reach cryogenic temperatures. Um, logistically, uh, purchasing dry ice for every experiment is not really sustainable. Uh, dry ice will evaporate on its own. And the vessel that we use uh, to cool um, the saline solution was an acrylic vessel. And acrylic has a pretty low thermal conductivity. And as a result, um, the time it takes to achieve any freezing uh, was resulted in very long uh, trials. And we also need, needed to minimize heat transfer um, from the surroundings. So the overall main issue uh, to take away is that the, the past design were not able to uh, achieve freezing of the salt water. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this cartoon is a graphic of our current design. We kept a styrofoam uh, container uh, kind of holding the system. Um, instead of an acrylic vessel, we have we switch it out to aluminum, and aluminum has a higher thermal conductivity. Um, however, on its own, the saline solution in the aluminum can, the whole thing kind of just freezes. So as a result, we use poly, polyethylene insulation to control the rate of heat transfer um, so that basically our, our entire solution doesn't freeze. Um, for the coolant, we, we switch to a mixture of isopropyl alcohol and dry ice cubes. Uh, using the two together, that is able to achieve cryogenic temperatures at around negative 10 degrees to negative 18 degrees Celsius. Salt water has a freezing point of, I think it's negative 21 degrees Celsius and fresh water is zero Celsius. So um, in that range, we can uh, achieve differential freezing uh, of our fresh and our salt water. And we also had a pump introduced into the coolant to aid in uh, flow of the coolant, kind of aid in the cooling process as well. And as Eric said, the autonomous stir was taken away, but um, we still had some manual stirring in order to prevent ice from freezing to the outside of the container and sticking so that we don't just see freezing kind of like from the outside in. And we actually can have a more even uh, freezing still if we manage to manually stir the solution. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Kyle and I'll talk about our, like, our current results that we found this year. So during, during uh, throughout testing this year, we found that um, when we did like an overall longer process for this for our prototype, we found that we yielded a better. We have a better year for ice, as well as we, um, as you see from tests one and two, that we were able to reduce the solution ppm by over half. And this is because we found that if we were to run our process to be roughly like thirty minutes, this we were able to reduce. The, the concentration by half, but as you see from test three, um, that our test three was when we did tests around like that lasted around like 15 minutes. It, the solution PPM wasn't, the ice PPM wasn't as great. So our goals for our current design is that we seek to find like a steady determinant gradient between uh, our heat exchanger between the coolant and the solution itself. Um, as well as we're trying to um, find how we can make the process more autonomous by possibly introducing artery into it. Into it. Um, determine a more reliable coolant source. Our current coolant source, which is isopropyl alcohol and dry ice, um, is simply like not sustainable 
because we constantly have to repurchase um, dry ice and introducing it during, throughout the whole process. So we're trying to find a more reliable cooling source, as well as um, our future research is on uh, reverse osmosis. And we're going to see next year how we, how we can introduce this into our current prototype. Um, so for our next phase, when we're looking into the future, um, we are hoping to scale this up to um, to make it so that we can use it for like larger purposes. And uh, so with that, we're going to have to increase the size of the vessel so that we can take large amounts of water into the system. And um, along with that, we want to maximize our efficiency so that we can make the most of our prototype. And um, next slide. And then our um, main goal is to be able to have uh, a different pipes or tubes so that we can um, get more water out of the system and um, also be able to uh, be thermodynamically like efficient so that um, the energy that is consumed is um, uh, good for our system. And then uh, as Kyle said, we are looking into reverse osmosis and comparing the energy that that system would take versus what we have right now. And in short, our new members of our team, Kyle, Yumi, and Harleen, really did make a difference in our, new, uh, in our current test result. And special thanks to Tesk, Aichi, and Professor Pin. Any questions? I guess not. Thank you. Hey guys, um, I have a question real quick. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the uh, reverse osmosis, um, would you guys be looking to sort of um, replace the whole system with reverse osmosis? Or would you be looking to sort of create a combination? Um, a, yeah, sort of like combination desalination process. Um, so yeah, could you, could you sort of touch on that a bit? It would be a, a combination kind of process. Either we either do the reverse osmosis first and then begin freezing or freezing and then reverse osmosis. So in time, we want to incorporate both. Awesome, thanks guys. No problem. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. All right, and once again, if you have any other questions, go ahead and go to their poster session later. Um, so now we'll start um, on our next team, which is Photonic Fabrics. And this team is very exciting because um, they are under an NDA, so we're actually going to pause the recording. So those of you who are here, um, you're the only ones who are ever going to really see this presentation. So I'm going to pause the recording and resume. There we go, okay. So thank you, Photonic Fabrics. And that was our six project teams. Um, so that was all of our presentations, but now we do have some pretty exciting awards to give to people. Let me see if I can flip here. Okay, so this year we have um, five different awards. We have Best Presentation and Best Poster. Um, those are based on your vote, actually. We want you to decide, you as the audience, to decide which team gave the best presentation, which team has the best poster. Um, so go ahead and after we go to poster sessions, or right now if you'd like, go to that URL and, or go to that tiny URL, uh, go to that QR code or that tiny URL and go ahead and vote for your, wh which team you thought was the best. And we'll be uh, posting those winning teams on our website and also giving them certificates once we're able to get back in person. I'm very excited for that moment. Um, and then we also have a Best Team Organization um, Award. Uh, this is the team that um, leadership has been watching all year. And we just find that their organization is pretty incredible. They communicate with each other really well. Um, they always have meetings at, you know, per, at great times for everyone. And they um, just have a really good uh, way of making things happen. So we wanted to uh, give a big shout out to active water treatment for all of that hard work. Um, I don't know if everyone can see it, but like you have a, a little button on the bottom of your screen that has reactions. And I would really love if everyone just gave that little clap emoji right now. I think that'd be really cool because this team really deserves it. 
So thank you, Active Water Treatment. And we'll be getting you a certificate too, and you'll also be posted on the website. <laughs> so we also have a Best Team Dynamic Award. And uh, this team just has a really wonderful, um, a really wonderful dynamic to them. They, they, they talk to each other, they, have, they do fun things together, they get stuff done, and they also just have a good time. They go on socials. Uh, we wanted to give Portable Wind Power a great shout out for that. So thank you to them as well. Again, clapping, clapping for you all. Thank you for being great. <laughs> and you'll also get a certificate and be on the website, I promise. <laughs> All right, so then these last awards are the MVP award. These are uh, the most valuable player is what MVP stands for. But uh, for us, the, the real sentiment of it is these people worked really hard to make their teams um, go really well this quarter or all year. Um, they're just like these amazing people who do these really incredible things to help their project move forward. So we wanted to give them a special moment on the slideshow to appreciate what they've done. So for AWT, we have David Lin. For CDS, we have Arun Jimbert. For Fuel Cell, we have Joyce Chen. For uh, Photonic Fabrics, we have Tanay Patil. PWP has Daniel Lee, and PWT has Brandon Huang. Um, a big shout out to you all. Thank you so much for everything you've done. We really appreciate it. Many clapping emojis. <laughs> All right, so then just a couple more slides before we head into poster session. Um, the applications for projects uh, for being on a project team are due on Monday at 11.59. The tiny URL, there, URL is there. Interviews will take place next week, Wednesday through Saturday via Zoom. Um, please watch out for an email asking for your availability to interview. Uh, please fill it out because otherwise you won't be scheduled for an interview and then it just won't be a win-win for anyone. Um, you're also strongly encouraged to go to poster session and just go talk to the teams before um, you finish applying. Um, that way you can talk, talk, talk about them um, really in, uh, in detail on your application and it'll look really good. And you can also get to know the team, which is very fun. To anyone who's applying, best of luck. I'm rooting, uh, I'm rooting for you. Uh, we have a lot of seniors graduating this quarter, so I'm hoping that you all get a spot on the team. All right, so poster session is gonna be a little weird this year, not gonna lie. Um, we're going to try to have six different, six different um, uh, Zoom meetings, and those are all on itprojects.org slash showcase 2020. Um, so if you are currently on a team in a moment, not quite yet, because um, I still have a couple more slides to go. Uh, if you're currently on a team, please go to that website and go to your Zoom meeting. So there should be a link on the website that has your team name. Click on the enter button to enter that uh, room and then uh, someone should share their screen to get the poster up and then you'll just wait for people to come in. If you're not currently on a team, please wait just a couple minutes so that everyone has time to go get everything set up um, and then I'll let you go to uh, join those meetings if you would like to, which I strongly encourage for everyone to do. Uh, the password for all of the meeting rooms is projects uh, with a capital P. It's the same um, password that you use to get into this showcase. Okay. So um, just a quick announcement. We have an upcoming Aichi event. It's called Niche, which is the Nano and Kemi Day. Uh, it's does, it's uh, next winter quarter, but we wanted to, it's such a big event that we wanted to start advertising for it now. Uh, it is a, a chance for anyone who's interested to um, present an idea. All of the teams will be presenting their, uh, all of the project teams will be presenting their projects at Niche 2021. Um, and but anyone else is, of it is welcome to join the competition as well. There will be a cash prize. Um, and there's also a career for aspect to it. So if you're looking for a company to network with, this is a good place to do it. Uh, we have other events coming up at iChi. Please check us out at iChi at UCSD on Facebook. Um, we have a lot of things happening the next week. In the next weeks, um, we have an alumni networking event just um, next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I would highly recommend it. I think it's going to be really great. Other than that, thank you for joining us. Thank you to UCSD, thank you to TESC, thank you to all of our project teams and all the amazing members. We couldn't do this without you. Um, so thank you for making a difference and um, being part of this group. If you didn't already, please sign in at tinyurl.com slash spring sign in. Um, again, that just lets us know who's here and um, if we have extra information that we need to send out at the end, it lets us know who to send it to. 
Um, the recording of this one will be on our website soon. And if you have any questions for leadership, drop them in chat. Otherwise, enjoy the posters. And also thank you to the seniors who are graduating this year. Um, you're really great. And I wish that we could give you an in-person graduation like you deserve. But for now, all I can give you is a huge thank you and as many emoji claps as I can possibly fit onto the screen. So with that said, please go enjoy poster session. Thank you for coming. And uh, if I forgot to say it earlier, my name is Eleanor Quirk. I'm the project's director for this next coming year. And I'm very excited to work with everyone. Um, and yeah, other than that, uh, if you have any questions, drop them in chat. I'll be here for a few minutes and enjoy poster session. Have a good day. I'll turn the music back on too. Rodrigo asked a question in chat that says, um, does recruitment happen only right now in spring? Um, recruitment happens in spring and also in fall. Uh, we'll be having recruitment again in either late September or late October. I don't quite remember which date we decided on. Um, fall applications are uh, a little more intense, I would say. There's just a lot more people who apply. Um, but it's definitely, that, that's where we get most of our, um, most people are recruited in fall. Does that answer your question?
Um, everyone has left the room, so we can I'm stop gonna... texting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and close the uh, close the recording. Yeah, I'll just move around the poster sessions. Hold on. Um... Stop recording. <laughs>